Rachel, thank you so much for coming and doing this with me. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited. I'm excited you're here. This has been like long awaited. I, I feel like it's, it's been at least two or three years that we've known each other via social media. Yeah. And, um, I feel like we're always like overlaid. I'm like, I'm there and you're doing this. And we know mutual people. And of course you're wearing that shirt. I'm wearing that shirt. <laughs> <Stuff like laughs> totally. That. It's a, there's a lot of wires crossing between us. A lot of wires crossing. Yeah. So I'm excited to have you. Um, I just want to, I think I'm just going to start from the beginning. So you where did this intuitive path, how did you get there? Like, how were you as a child and we'll work from there? Yeah. So I was definitely a very sensitive kid. Um, I was just like a sweet, sensitive, quiet, like my mom always says I was like the easiest baby. I just slept through the night, like at like two or three weeks. Um, So I just was like a a gentle soul, essentially, from birth. And um, I really, I lost my sparkle, if you will, around the age of six or seven, where I had some abuse. And it caused me to withdraw. And it's funny, so this abuse was totally repressed. And um, it didn't come up for me until I was like 37. And... um, I I remember these little points where like my dad said a thing to me at one random point in time. And he was like, at at some point you just got weird. He's like, you just, you were just different. Like, and I don't know what happened to you. And like now, and I'm like, I don't know what happened now. Like I understand what happened. So I lost that. Like, I think like that sparkle and that like trust. And I started dealing with a lot of, um, shame. <clears throat> so, so, and, and I use food to, uh, numb that shame essentially. And so like, I turned to food very early. So I was like, I was a chubby kid. So I was really sensitive. If anyone said anything about my weight, um, I was very insecure about it from like second grade on, like, I remember I look at pictures and I see, like, I remember that photo day and being like really worried that I was going to have a double chin And like, no one was saying that to me. No one was being cruel to me at home, but I had this trauma that was like creating all the shame in my body. And I I didn't understand it and nobody knew what had happened to me. So uh, nobody really knew what to do for me either. And this was in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties too. And so like, it just wasn't as common for people to like get mental health services for their kids or anything. So anyway, I I lived with this for 30 years and it drove me to become a nutritionist. And I got really into, really away from spirituality and really away from my intuition. I went so hardcore down the like math science path and I worked in hospitals and um, I, I wound up in like my late twenties where I was just really lost, like, I had this great job. I was like excelling in my career, but it wasn't like fueling my soul in any way. And what I learned later on is that I, I'm uh, very, very much an empath. So I can read into feel other people's emotional states and like their stories. So I could always read people extremely well. And I just thought everyone could do that. Like I had no idea that this was a unique experience. So um, in my late twenties, I was like always desiring these deep connections with people. Like I'm a, I'm a like, let's go deep and go all the way or let's not talk at all. (laughs) Like I'm not a surface fluff girl. So no small talk happening here. So I, I would, I found myself in my late twenties. I was living alone. Like I had this great career, but I was lost. Like I was desiring these deep connections but anytime I was around people, I was picking up all their stuff and I was attaching all these energy cords everywhere I went. And so the only way that I could get relief from that was through alcohol. So I was like the biggest party girl, like, because it was the only way I could get relief from all of the energy of other people, but, but have deep connection with people, like be calm enough in my nervous system to like talk and speak um, my mind. So 
And then after these like binging party weekends, I would be alone on Sunday and I would have even more energy from all these other people attached to me. And so then I would find myself like binge eating to numb my own feelings and the feelings of all the other people I was picking up on. So, you know, like from the outside, things were good, but on the inside, I was like really suffering. And fast forward to like 2014, I started going through like a whole financial crisis because I bought a condo in New York in like 2008 and then the market crashed and I was way underwater with it. And it was like just so stressful and horrible. And like, I didn't know what to do. And I knew I needed some help, but I, I, I knew like traditional, like, like therapy or a counselor wasn't for me. So I just literally went online and I Googled like spiritual teacher or healer or something. I don't even know. And I found this woman locally and I just like made an appointment. I was absolutely terrified the day I went, I was like so nervous, like driving to her office and I went and I started working with her and it absolutely changed my life. So she was a medium, uh, energy healer, all those things. Um, and she taught me about angels. She taught me I was an empath. She, I got Reiki from her. She cut cords for me. And I remember the first time she told me I was an empath and I got this healing and she cut all these cords for me and I left her office. I remember stopping at the grocery store and I felt like I was moving in slow motion and everything was like spinning around me. And I was like, what the, like, what the hell is going on? It felt horrible. I felt totally disconnected from the world. And so I went home and I went to bed and the next morning I woke up and I was like, shot out of a cannon. I had so much energy. I was so happy. I was up at like 6 a.m. like doing dishes and cleaning the house. And my partner partner at the time was yelling at me like, are you okay? Like, what are you doing? Because this was very out of character for me. And I was like, I'm great. I feel so good. So that was my first experience working with energy and really understanding just what an empath I was and how much I was picking up from other people all the time. So that was really the beginning of my journey to understanding how to work with my empathy and then shifting it from this like curse where I was disempowered and taking on other people's stuff and people pleasing to avoid conflict and turning it into this more empowered state where I choose when to turn the empathy on and off and how much to engage with it. And I use it to have a very high level of discernment with who I engage with and where I put my energy. And I also know the power of how much I can shift energy for other people and when to do that and when not to do that. (laughs) So that's kind of the beginning was like really learning about my empathy. Um, And then as I, as I, I went through a whole physical healing journey and that's when my repressed trauma came up And that answered all the questions about why I had turned to food, about why I was so shut down, why I was so afraid to speak. I was painfully shy. I would like go to parties and in high school and be like the kid, like the girl who like didn't say anything. And it explained why I went to alcohol to open up my voice and to get me comfortable enough in my skin to actually like be. And, um, now I've learned to do that without alcohol, (laughs) thankfully. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it just explained a lot. And so uh, that's kind of like my journey in a nutshell. And then as I went through that physical healing, it also radically awakened my intuition. And so I started, I was working as a nutritionist in my own practice. And then I started bringing intuitive aspects into my business. And now that's primarily what I do. And I don't really do nutrition work anymore. Um, so that's kind of the journey, like in a nutshell, in a, in a very, in a very small nutshell. Yeah. I'm, I'm pausing for two seconds. Yeah. I have a pin in my hair and it is ruining my life. And I don't know why all of a sudden it's hurting. Oh, that can be very uncomfortable. I found it. Okay. She's out. Thank it. So, okay. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, and with bringing it into your intuitive practice, at what point, like, what does that look like in the, in the beginning? Cause I know that I read a little bit about, um, the intuitive healer that you worked with. 
was she the one that kind of like sent you down that path or? So I think it's been really a self-guided journey. I worked right. with that particular healer for a number of years. And then it got to a point where I felt like I was ready for some, someone else to help me and guide me. So I kind of put it out there into the universe. Like I'm ready for my next teacher. And this was around the time that Doreen Virtue had gone like born again Christian. Yeah. And I was like, and so I randomly Googled like what happened to Doreen Virtue? Like, I'm just, like, I'm like, I need the backstory here. And I found this woman who had written this beautiful article about her take on Doreen's journey. And it was so loving and thoughtful and like just from the highest perspective of how this could be for Doreen's benefit. And I was like, this is, this is my woman. Like this is who I need to work with. So I had a couple of sessions with her and then I started doing, uh, these intuition courses with her. And, um, so I really dedicated energy and effort to like unlocking my intuition. And so through, so I think we all have these intuitive channels. Everyone's an empath to some degree, but we have particular talents or particular abilities that we can develop. So for me, I started working on clairaudience, clairvoyance, claircognizance, clairsentience. I started working on like really getting solid in my boundaries. And in doing that, then my intuition can be fully on because I'm in this clean, clear energy field. So now I can turn it on. I can turn it down. It's never totally off, but I can turn it way down. Um, and I can tap in very quickly now because like the channels are clear essentially. Yeah. And so for me, that came, that came through physical cleansing. That was a huge piece of it. Um, and then it also came through uh, dedicating the time to learning about it and studying it and practicing. And then it came through using it in service to my clients and then having these firsthand experiences come through where they're not from a person, they're not from a book, like they came direct to me. So th those were like the three ways that the intuition really kicked in like full steam for me. And I'm sure there's more to develop there too. We'll see what happens as I <laughs> grow. Because this is oftentimes a lot of my listeners are like very um, new to all of this. What do you mean by physical cleansing? Yeah, so I did medical medium protocols pretty hardcore for about three years, which is a whole food plant-based diet. I went totally plant-based because it just felt right for me. I, um, I read a book called The World Peace Diet by William Tuttle, I believe it is. And it was about the inherent violence in our food system. So of course in factory farming, this is mm -hmm. really bad, but even in small local farms, like there's still the taking of an animal's life and there's still like adrenaline that runs through the animal system and, and all that stuff. And so, um, so that's a different story, but the factory farming, like consuming factory farmed meat is of such a, so we are what we eat energetically, I think. Yeah. So eating factory farmed meat that's been like abused and that animal has been like stripped of community stripped of its individuality and not received love right um taken from its mother right away like it's a very low vibration food right and then you'd like you'd never go into a slaughterhouse right because you it, it'd be horrifying so like he was his premise is that we there's all this violence in the food system and then but we have a blind eye to it but we're consuming that violence. And so the consumption of the violence through factory farming is what fuels war and it fuels uh, like self-judgment and all of these, you know, terrible things, shame and, and all these things that we deal with. So that like hit me over the head and I was like, oh shit, I really can't eat meat anymore <laughs> or eggs or dairy. So um, yeah, if you want to go that route, that book it was absolutely transformational for me. So that in combination and like really understanding energy at that point, that in combination with the physical cleansing I was desiring uh, was huge. And so with, with the physical cleansing, I'm eating tons of raw plant foods like smoothies and juices and salads and potatoes and small amounts of grains and beans. Um, 
and, and it was uh, it was a labor of love for sure. Like it was a lot of time in the kitchen, but it's it's kind of what I like to do anyway. And so, um, and it was kind of an evolution of my education, having been in a very Western nutrition educational system. I got a bachelor's in nutrition, a master's in nutrition. I worked in hospitals for a decade to like really turn my back on that and follow this medium that says, this is what you eat to cleanse your body of heavy metals, of viruses, of toxins, uh, to replace nutrient deficiencies that are decades or that are um, generations old. That's what I did for about three years. And I reversed autoimmune condition. I had um, heart palpitations, dizziness, low blood pressure that went away, um, like little bumps on the back of the arm, keratosis pilaris, that went away. There's lots of other things I can't even remember. Um, so I just went through this massive physical cleansing and in doing that, you know, you clean up the liver, you remove heavy metals from the brain, you decalcify the pineal gland, which is the center for intuition. So through that process, that's what helped. That was a big thing that brought up the repressed trauma because we hold these energies in our body. And so when my body started to become more clean, my blood, literally my muscles, my tissues became more clean. Uh, these underlying emotional things that are like, like in my mind's eye, I would see it as like these bubbles of trauma or wounds. And then we stack all this like toxins and junk food and stuff on top of it because we're trying to avoid it. So when you strip that all away, it's like, here's the underlying issue. And, and that's good because that, that's the stuff you want to get down to when you want to heal and you want to release. And so I feel completely free of that trauma now. I don't hold any resentment. I don't hold any anger. I don't, I, I, I understand why it was a piece of my journey. And I, I understand why it was something I needed to overcome. And so that kind of unconditional love for my own journey is a big piece of what I learned and going through that and stripping away because food was a big coping mechanism for me it was a huge coping mechanism so stripping that away got me down to the raw stuff that I really needed to heal to step into my intuition in that capacity and to hold space for other people as they go that deep too so that's what the food that's why the food was a big piece of my journey and I don't think it's something that everyone needs to do but if, but when I found that information, it was like every cell in my body was like, yes, this is the information you've been looking for. This is the healing you need. These are the answers you've been searching for in 15 years of studying nutrition. And I just went full steam ahead with it. Um, and it's one of the best things that I've ever done. I don't, I don't follow it uh, to the T now because I don't need to. I'm not called to, but um, I do still keep a whole foods plant-based as the core of my diet. And it really does affect my ability to access my intuition. Cause when I'm eating those higher vibration foods like raw fruits and raw vegetables and fresh juices um, and organically grown local produce that like my local farmer put their hands on and put love into, they're just holding a higher vibration. And so the more high vibration foods you eat, the easier it is to maintain a higher vibration in your physical body and then in your, your aura and your energetic body. So that was a big piece for me in kind of re-tapping back into that intuition that I think I always had, but got shut down. Like most people, they have it and they kind of lose it. Do you feel, was it like super difficult because uh, we come from this Western society and I know moms, I'll be the first one to say it. Like I binged on the wine when the kids came around the food and you're repressing everything, right? Like, yeah. Um, like sugar, sugar in, in, I'm keeping my emotions down. I'm keeping that. I'm always feeding that, that monster per se. But once you found that, uh, the protocol and felt called to that. Was it difficult for you to then implement that? Or it no? wasn't, it wasn't too difficult because like my body was screaming. Yes. Like yeah. every song my body was like, this is the truth yeah. for me. Right. And it, truth is 
it's um <laughs> what I call truth. I don't want to say it's subjective, but it's like it fluctuates, right? Like we have whole different truths at different time and different people have different truths. And, and I think that's normal and we should honor that. So for me, that was my truth at that time. That was what I needed. And um I just believed in it so strongly that like I had so much conviction for it. And with my background as a nutritionist, I had all the tools to coach myself through the process. Yeah. Um, and, and I wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I can remember one time going to a party um, at a relative's house and I was like, okay, I'm not eating the pepperoni. I'm not eating the cheese balls. I'm not eating the Ritz crackers and I'm not drinking. And I was like, oh shit, like, what do I do? What do I do with my hands? (laughs) How do I operate? Yeah. And I, and it made me realize how much, you know, it might be labeled social anxiety, but honestly, for me, I think it's my body telling me I'm not in an aligned environment and I'm, yeah. I'm not listening to my body saying like the energy here is not a match for you. So I, I approach everything in terms of energy exchange yeah, and, energy, and, and, and vibrational match. So when you're in a really good mood and like you're happy and you feel good, it's easy to eat a salad, right? When you're like PMSing and you're grumpy and you just got some big bill you weren't expecting, it's like chocolate, wine, French fries, like whatever your thing is. So if we can, so so if we can hold ourselves in like a a cleaner field and a higher vibration, it's just easy to eat that way. And so again, I wasn't perfect. Like there were times I fell off, but I was so committed through just the feeling in my body and this knowingness that it was what I needed. And then when you see your symptoms start to get better and I had psoriasis for um, 13 years. And when you see your psoriasis start to go away, you're like, okay, like this is, this is working. And like my energy was so good. So like when you feel that good and then you make the other choices and you're like, wow, I'm tired. I'm crabby. Like I have all these negative emotions. You're like, I, this isn't worth it. Like, it's just not worth it. So you you come back to it pretty quickly. So it wasn't, it, it, then it took a lot of effort. Like I said, it's a lot of time in the kitchen and I would bring my own food everywhere I went and um, people had questions about it, but I, like, I had this background as a nutritionist with all the tools and with the, um, like the credentials that I, like, I, I didn't, I didn't care what people thought. And if people had questions, like I was happy to answer them, but like, no, like, I had really good boundaries around it. Like nobody was going to tell me otherwise. So um, it makes me think, I think about uh, years ago or whatever, when we would go to birthday parties with Dominic and the first thing he'd do is not because it was, it was almost like a survival thing, right? Like just, I need to put in as many cupcakes as possible because my, the energy and I need like a (laughs) jolt and I need like, it's just like cupcakes, cupcakes, sugar, and it wasn't because it was taken away. Like later on down the road, I was like, no, he's trying to match the energy. And he's, he's like completely depleted. And mm-hmm. he, he needs like the monster energy drink of kids. You know what I mean? And he's like, he's done. Yeah. Um, and it, so the food can have like a grounding and a stabilizing effect. Like it can, it can hold you in your body when you get yeah. in situations that are you want to just like the soul is like peace out. I can't yeah. deal with this. It can help like hold you and ground you. So, um, those, those, um, you know, the more dense foods are like, they support the lower chakras. So it's like literally, you know, a cupcake is obviously not ideal, but higher fat foods are supporting the sacral chakra. So you can tolerate being in groups more like, yeah. so it, there are, physiologic and energetic reasons why we do that it, it really it it's a powerful coping mechanism yes. but it's not right it comes with some side effects I'm, I'm actually very glad you talked about that because uh somebody that I work with especially with the kids I remember there being a lot of guilt around that when we were doing a lot of work um spiritually and like cleaning up and doing all this stuff but, but like Um, and I was being like, why are we like eating the stuff that I have like already removed out? And she's like, you're just, 
it's your body's natural like direction way of like trying to ground you and bring you back in. So like, mm-hmm. we need to stop thinking of it as bad and good. And she's like, you'll, sh- you know, you'll shift right back to those higher vibrating foods. Once you do the other work that needs to happen, that you need to be in your body. Yeah. And, and so I'm glad that you're like in that, um, that you spoke on that because o- oftentimes everything is like love and light and high vibration and then, and and I'm tired of it. <laughs> we, we, the, the 3D world is very dense and it's really heavy. And like our bodies are heavy. Like think about how much pain you feel on a daily basis. Just like my, like my back is a little sore right now. Like there's, like there's always something that we're kind of dealing and managing. And like my approach with food and with all things coaching and with all the intuitive messages is the last thing we need is more shame and guilt. Like yes. those are not motivating factors. Those are paralyzing emotions. Yes. And so to try and use that to make someone behave differently is completely, you don't understand emotions at all if you're doing that. So my, like, uh, my approach is to bring it back to like, okay, let's, let's bring it back to really it is unconditional love. Like just cause I ate a cupcake or just because I ate like a, you know, a piece of meat and I don't want to do that but like I yeah. my body was like craving that for some energetic effect right like there's no judgment it's just like okay I did that and we move on and it's the same with with kids you know they're just it food is just a coping mechanism and yes. so it runs the gamut right it can be comfort which is fine it can become uh like the middle ground. So the extreme would be completely numbing, which is what we don't want to do right when that's happening all every single day. And then in between it's, there's a big range there. So like using food for comfort is completely natural and good. And we are not meant to be robots and eat in one perfect way all the time. And the way you eat is going to evolve and shift and change depending on your age, depending on your environment, depending on your family, depending on so many things. So it's natural for that to, to kind of shift and change. So yeah, no shame, no guilt, no judgment, like shame will paralyze. I'm the queen of, I know exactly when I'm shaming myself because I stand in the middle of the room and I don't do anything because I'm just, I'm paralyzed by her. Yeah. So yeah, I get that. All right. I'm moving. I'm glad that we, we talked about this. I want to move to like you being a mom and like how, like, give me the story of that, like walking into motherhood. Yeah. So I, um, got pregnant pretty quickly. Um, was immediately extremely sick for the first like 14 or 16 weeks. Me too. (laughs) Um, Like so sick. Like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't work. I couldn't eat. I lost, I probably lost 10 pounds. Like I was like, I look at pictures and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was like a rail. Um, Kate Middleton sick. I remember she was pregnant when I was pregnant and she was in the hospital and I was like, she's so lucky. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't throw up, but it was like just to the point before you throw up. Uh, 24 seven. And so then, um, so I, th- I think I just had this big energy coming through me. It's the only way I can describe it. And um, she just immediately taught me about surrender immediately. And um, in the third trimester was like back pain, couldn't sleep. I had pubic symphysis dysfunction. So I'd get this like jolt of pain down my inner thigh if I moved in a particular way or too fast um, the heart, like all the things. So it was, um, so pregnancy was tough. I had a beautiful birth and she was super healthy. Um, so postpartum was easier for me than pregnancy. Thank goodness. Um, but very quickly, she was a terrible sleeper. Um, she would only sleep on someone like you just, you like, couldn't, Anytime you put her down, she just immediately wake up, like no matter how many times you tried. And so I quit pretty quickly was like, all right, everybody's telling me like, this is how you're supposed to do it, but it's not working and I just need to survive. So co-slept with her the whole time. Never, she never once slept in a crib. <laughs> um, and she was very mommy centric. Like I was her 
safe space. I was her comfort zone. Like, and I think she, she's five now. I think she is very sensitive. And I think that she really just felt like I was her safe space. And it took her until she was about um, four to like, and I think that's typical for kids, but I think it yeah. was, it was more than the average kid. Um, so she very quickly taught me about surrender and, you know, everybody wanted me to sleep train her, the pediatrician. I had an early childhood development woman come over and she like greened me out for co-sleeping and I put her in the baby carrier while she was there to get her nap. She would only nap for 30 minutes at a time. And I was like, by like this, you're never coming back to my house. Like it was so bad. And, um, so I just, I just moved with her rhythms. I co-slept with her. She would breastfeed multiple, multiple, multiple times a night. She went through phases where she would wake up every hour. Um, and I was, it was like having insomnia cause I never got a full sleep cycle. So I just, and, and again, there was all this pressure to like break her spirit or make her into like put her in the box what other ba what babies are supposed to do and I I thought about doing it a couple of times but I never did it and um it created strife in my relationship too like my husband wanted to do that and I was like you try <laughs> but I, I I couldn't fathom the idea of leaving her in a room alone to cry like as an empath no as someone who understands uh like I'd done past life regressions and, and I've heard people tell stories of like remembering being alone in a crib crying. And I'm like, no, like I can't, I can't do that to her. And it, it like, it, it's wrong. And then when you look at the, the science behind it and you look at the stress hormones, um, the babies don't, the stress hormones don't reduce. They just shut down. They stop crying. So, you know, I was just like, no. So I, I always felt like I had to protect her. Like, you know, the, the modern world has all these parameters to put you in a box and turn you into part of the machine, if you will. Right. And like, first of all, she wouldn't stand for it. She's very strong willed and very fiery. And like, if I tried, it would have been a nightmare. And, but I just knew, I just intuitively knew that it was wrong. It wasn't right for her. And so was it way more difficult for me to parent that way? Hell yeah. It was way more difficult, but I just knew it was the right thing. And now at five, you know, and I, and I looked at attachment parenting too, which the premise is you create secure attachments early on. And then that facilitates independence and confidence later down the road. Whereas the kind of more traditional is you strip away attachments to force independence. And, but what you're really doing is creating a stress state and stress never fosters confidence or independence in any way, shape or form. So I always felt like I had to fight for her rights and I had to fight for who she was. Um, and so sleep slowly, but surely got better. Um, she still sleep. I still sleep with her half the night. She does half the night by herself. And then I go get in her. She has a bed on the floor. I get in. Um, we tried preschool with her just to get her some interaction with other kids she didn't have any siblings she didn't have any cousins we didn't have kids in the neighborhood um that was a disaster I think she was way too sensitive energetically to be in a classroom she would scream and cry in the morning before we would drop her off they'd have to like rip her out of my arms um that only lasted about four months and then uh I was like okay enough is enough like this is not She's, she's you not it before I did. Ready. I did three years of it. Three did you? Years. Three wow. years of that ripping out. Yeah. It's yeah. brutal. Yep. It is. It is brutal. Yeah. For everybody. I mean, and then my, I'm, I'm ruined. I'm all upset. Like, I'm like, how can I work now for the day while she's there? And they're like, she calms down as soon as you leave. And I'm like, I think she's shutting down more than calming down. So, um, yeah. So, she taught me a lot about honoring the person that shows up in front of you rather than trying to make them into who you think they should be. And I still, to this day, feel like I have to protect her and I have to, I have to honor and see who she is because 
I can see that in every person. I can see everyone's highest potential and their highest expression. It's part of my, my gift, my intuitive gifts and my empathy. And so I see that in her and I, I feel like as a mother, I have to protect that because people want to strip down kids from who they are and try to make them into the standard kid, which doesn't exist and, um, you know, put them in the box. And uh, she's just not that kind of kid. So she's taught me a lot about sticking to what I know is right. And when I do that, we get good results. And when I don't, and I let outside influence sway me, it's, it's tough. So yeah, she's been a really, really incredible teacher for sure. Teacher for sure. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have this memory of when I, I really sunk, well, one of the reasons that it really sunk in was we had friends over and Eve was outside and she literally cleared my garden of every flower and like came in with like seven bouquets and like gave them to me. She's like, look, I got these for you. I love you. And I remember pausing. I wasn't upset. And then um, somebody had said, she just cleared out your garden. Like there's no flowers left. And all I kept hearing was, there's such a short window of when she'll be, I will, she'll be in love with me. Not that she'll always be in love with me, but like, I, I remember being really little and like being so in love with my mother, you know, and it's such this window is it's not short, but it only happens in its way in its own form for so long. And the only thing I said to the lady was, or the friend was just like, that's okay we'll just plant more flowers next year. Yeah. And this is the only way that she can give me a gift, I guess. And like, then that always just like stands with me like that. It's such, it's such a small window of that. I don't know. There's, there's these moments of choice where we like yeah. punish kids for their expression because it's not what we had in mind, or we allow them to be in their expression and we let go of our agenda. Like, yeah. And we have to let go of our agenda a lot and allow them to explore and play in the world, even if it means our flower gardens get decimated. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it, you get to choose how you see it, right? You can choose it as, oh, my flower bed got destroyed, or you can choose to see it as, wow, this little girl got this idea, this wild idea to pick all the flowers and she went through with it and look how happy and proud and excited she is. And you can foster that or you can smother it. Yeah. And I think a lot of us got a lot of smothering and we're as mothers in this time, we're learning how to not do that to our kids. And I think this is how we change the world is mm -hmm. one mother and one child at a time, because then you change the whole collective generation and then they, yeah. and it ripples down, you know? So rather than having all these traumas ripple down, which has been the norm, we're in this new point where this generation of mothers that we're in is we're like, okay, no more. Like we're, no more. we're really healing the traumas. We're really witnessing the generational patterns. We're really staying in our boundaries. We're really protecting our kids and not breaking them. And I, I truly think that is how we step into a different era of parenting and a different era of the world. Yep, we are. I, I think about that all the time is that, not that I don't think other generations, but just right, just now for the sake of the conversation, like we are a generation that stopped and said no more. And, but we also knew that we signed up for a really big not only have to deal with how the generations before are, you know, feel about our parenting, we only have one way and formula in which we were parented. So now we have to develop a whole other way of parenting. And um, it, it's going to be a huge undertaking. Yeah. I, also, I, I also say that knowing, and I've done it before, where I look back at my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, and I realized where they, they made choices in changing their parenting from the generation before them mm -hmm. and what they healed too. 
Totally. Yep. You know, like I look at my, my great grandmother and I think her major contribution was healing rape. Like no more rape, no more raping is happening from here on out. And I will take the brunt. Mm. And like, she stopped it there. And like my next grandmother was like, no more poverty. We're not living, we're not living in that way. Um, and then, you know, and then as we go down, like no more, no more abuse, we're, we're taking that way down. And so you see as much as you want to sit there and be like, well, we're the only ones doing it. No, they did it before. If you really slow down, even if it doesn't look in the, the healthiest of ways. Totally, totally. Um, but yeah, so. I think it's it's different because the we're not just doing it in like the 3D, like physical, yeah. like we're parenting on a, the I think the most emotional level that, yeah. and it's totally new territory. Yeah. You know, we're, we're parenting from like a neurodevelopment, uh, approach and a secure attachment approach and, uh, an intuitive approach. Right. And, um, so yeah, it totally there it's been happening for generations. Um, but I think it's happening faster now. And I think the, the hopefully the level of trauma that future generations have to endure is lesser and lesser and lesser. And then we don't have broken people running the world <laughs> yeah we have really whole uh complete happy grounded secure people making big decisions yep so, yeah. and re- and like like you said like the more and more that we do this with each individual child our own child right the more attachment and stuff like that that is a large portion of healing the world you can, mm-hmm. you can instate all the laws and protocols and you can, you can take guns away from everybody. You can, you can do all the things, um, but it will not matter if we are not like, we're not doing the work ourselves mm-hmm. and within our families, it's not going to work. Totally. Yeah. It, it's the future lies with each individual is yeah. really really where it, where it is and then how we translate that down to our kids and beyond yep and that's going to be the hardest the hardest freaking work cleaning yeah. up your own yard <laughs> in your own that is going to be the hardest work yeah but it's the work that is the most worthwhile because when you get your yard cleaned up then you know as soon as one piece of garbage gets thrown in and you can quickly address it and clean it out right if mm-hmm. like once you get it clean, it's, you're just maintenance, you know, yeah. you're, you're not digging up old septic tanks and stuff that you're like, yeah. Oh, what are we going to do with this? Like you're, you're, it's just maintenance. And so, and then you get to, um, develop it right. And like plant flower beds and put in annuals that come back every year. And, you know, you get to add, you just get to add to it and it just gets better and better. So yeah, that, that cleanup phase is the hardest where you have to do the deepest work, but once you get it cleaned up, like it's really, really nice and things do get a lot easier. And other things happen too. The neighbors watch intently Mm -hmm. and then people, I mean, if you live in a neighborhood, like then somebody, if you start cleaning up, then somebody else starts cleaning up. Mm -hmm. They will take notice to your own family dynamic. Like, and then somebody's going to come around and ask you what you did. And even if it's whispering, I want to know what you did differently. Yeah. Why did that matter? Um, what kind of fertilizer are you using? I know this is like the metaphor of metaphors, (laughs) but seriously people. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, they'll come asking and you won't, you'll know who it's worth the energy spending to tell. And then you will. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not that you want to hold back from things, but there are people just, you know, that they're not there with the right intention. Mm -mm. And the people that are there with the right intention you'll just want to you'll know at what level you can give them or not give them tell them what you did tell them what you didn't do yeah um 
So I would say like that really comes down to healthy discernment. Yeah. And so to go back to the love and light BS stuff, um, I think there's this message that like, we have to love any, everyone and we can't say anything bad about anyone. If we do, we're in judgment, blah, blah. And like, I'm here to like wipe that story. Like you are not meant to give your energy to everyone or even to a lot of people. So for me, what I, I coach my clients in energy exchange. So when you like in this conversation, even energy exchange, right? We're both bringing the same amount of energy. We're both giving, we're both receiving, like we're both going to finish this call and be like, wow, that was great. I feel good. If you get in a situation with someone and after the conversation, you feel depleted or you feel anxious or you feel tired or you're like, oh, like what's something's wrong now. That's an uneven energy exchange where someone is taking more energy than they are giving, or you are allowing yourself to give more energy than you're going to receive back. And so I think like as more sensitive people, as women, we've been trained to give away our energy a lot. And, and if, especially if you've been trained to be a people pleaser, or that was your survival tactic in childhood, um, or if you're an empath and you don't like to feel other people get upset, like we just, we give and give and we give, and then we're like sick and we're depleted and we're eating the junk food and, you know, or we're, or we're paralyzed and we energetically paralyzed and we can't do anything. So like when you get into, like when I host retreats and, and live events, this, the container is so safe and so sacred that everyone comes and they just get to go like, like they just get to relax and be themselves. And you don't have to, not that you're pretending in real life, but sometimes you have to like have these like walls, right? Like people are like infringing yeah. on your energy field and you're like, I don't know, like it's confusing. And so, and when we're put in these environments, like schools where you're forced in these rooms with a teacher who's potentially very out of alignment, exhausted, whatever they're doing, and kids who have either had abuse or they're, you know, they have ADD and they can't, they're not meant to sit in a classroom. And so it's disruptive. And then you, you know, you have a kid who's particularly loud, who's acting out, right? Like it, it's so much for the nervous system to handle that we just, we get used to that being the norm. And that's not our norm at all. We're not meant to be in these environments where the energy is very erratic and chaotic. And there's not an even energy exchange between all parties. And so I always encourage people like really watch your energy when you engage and interact with different people. When I talk, when I share, when I channel, when I run meditations and things, I am wide open. Like I'll talk about anything. I am like, nothing is, is off limits. When I talk to my neighbor, I am not there. Like I, I think people think I'm always this open and I'm always like out there. Pretty, I'm not, I shut it down when I am in like environments with people who don't, they're just not there yet. They don't, they don't have that level of understanding. Right. And it's not like a hierarchy. It's not like a, a judgment, but it's a discernment about, is it safe to open my energy field in this space? And most of the time it's not safe. So I don't go around talking about angels. I don't go around talking about energy healing. I, mm -hmm. I save that for safe spaces. Like when I get, when I create a safe space in my world and when I'm in a safe space, like I'm a totally open book. Um, but when I go about my day out in the world, I'm extremely discerning of who I will even engage with beyond a hey a hello at the grocery store right so yes. um, I want to give like a quick story to just give an example of this I went to a retreat in um December and we were doing this Temescal uh sweat lodge thing and like the women were going in and we were all going to get like getting naked in there and the there were men who came to like get the fire going move the lava rocks all that stuff as like support right and one of the men that showed up, um, I didn't know any of them, right? I'm just visiting. But the woman who was like the assistant there, she was like, oh, I, like, I'm not getting naked in front of this guy. Like, I don't feel comfortable. Like, I know him in public and, and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, don't like trust that. And then like, 
before this conversation, I had crossed paths with him through the yard. And I just immediately got this like, mm, not good vibes feeling like, like, I just, I just know. Right. And mo a lot of people just know. So I don't fake that. I don't try to push my way through that. I just don't engage. And if it means it seems like I'm not friendly, I'm not friendly to people who aren't going to match my energy. So, um, you know, later on, she was like, you know, I feel bad saying that, like, he's probably a really nice person. And I'm like, no, I'm like, that's your discernment. You're not judging him. And she told me the story. She's like, well, I've heard that. And I've seen like at events that he has spiritual gifts that, but he only shares them with like beautiful women. And I was like, mm -mm. like, no, like, yeah, that's fake love and light. And if you are getting a, a signal that it's not right, don't go there. Don't over like stop overriding any signal that tells you no. And like, would something bad have happened? No. And like, we, you know, but, um, I think those are the signals that we've been taught to override. And that's the intuition and the body that we've been, we've had to override to live in society around a lot of dysfunction. And so it's like really coming back to that place when you feel the slightest inkling, you hear that one little word or that little feeling in your gut, like trust it and listen to it. Like, this is what I teach now is for women to connect to their inner authority and only follow that. Because when you follow your inner, inner authority, it's going to guide you to the most beautiful places. And sometimes it's going to ask you to make crazy decisions, but crazy. the crazier the decision, <laughs> like selling your house and getting in an RV and driving like selling your house and getting an RV. <laughs> yeah. the, the, but the better life is going to be for you. And so I, that is like the core of who I am and what I teach now is discernment and energy exchange and inner authority and and really letting that be the compass that navigates everything that you do. I think this is massively important for parents of highly intuitive children too, like massively when we talk about energy exchange. I, you, if you're in this particular scenario, you've gone to the playground and been like, does your kid do X, Y, and Z? And people look at you nuts. That's because they can't. They, they can't go there because there's no context. They're, they're not in that space. Mm -hmm. You know, and then also too, we all go in the closet, you know, we go in the closet and keep it to ourselves. And maybe also it's less about being in the closet to protect our kids, but like really fostering and developing this discernment because you can't go out there and put your child at risk or be dragging in this energy and these, and then the energy be directed at our children that, you know, that's what we're doing being quote unquote in the closet. Mm -hmm. um, but discernment is massive in that. I mean, I, I'm, so we're here um, doing this RV life and we're staying at the specific campground where there's a lot of communal fire pits and super nice. You meet so many people. They're really wonderful, very open-minded, but my discernment has gotten sharpened heavily because they'll ask me what I do. And then you sit there and you're like, uh, like you have to really feel it out because you're working with very little information. This isn't your, your neighborhood where you already kind of have a idea with information playing around. I don't know these people. And so I have to sit there and be like, I do consulting. If you say consulting, nobody ever asks you what it is. <laughs> yes. um, or I have a podcast. Oh, what's your podcast about parenting? And it's been a handful of people that I've given like the, um, the actual name of the podcast and yeah. Uh, just in general, what the general, what we're talking about here. I just tell people I'm a life coach. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause you know, again, it's like, is this a safe space to open yourself up? And most of the time it's not. And so like, you really want to tread lightly. And, and here's the thing too, like 
you know, like we're, we're breaking the mold to some degree, like we're, we're parenting in the way that we know is right for our unique and sensitive children. And we're parenting in the way that, you know, we know would have been really helpful to us when we were sensitive children. And not everyone is going to understand that because everyone's coming with their own beliefs and their own systems. And my belief is to be completely open to whatever anyone wants to do, right? But that's not everyone's stance. There's more of that than there ever was, I think. But um, yeah, like you don't, like, you know, you don't, if you live in a city, you don't open your door and just let anyone walk in or out. Yes. It, it, it's it's the same with your energy field. You don't just open the door to anyone. You have to protect it. And you have to know, like the other example I give is like, we can make our auras really big and open and like, and receptive and hold people in our energy fields, or we can shrink them down. So when we're in a space like this, like you and I are very open right now, because we've created a container and we're holding the intention for this experience. But if you get on a subway in New York City, you're not going to walk in with this open aura because people are going to immediately want to take from it because it's really nice it's really powerful Mm -hmm. so you have to be discerning so when you get on a subway you close your aura watch people everyone's closing their auras down because it's the only safe way to be and so when we have these little beings these little children that are really big and open we have to be really careful whose energy we put them in because people are predatory there are people who have entities attached to them who've got trauma who have untreated you know psychiatric illness and and addictions and things and and these little bright highly sensitive beings have these big beautiful auras and and people want to steal from them it's what happened to me and so we do have a job to be more protective of them than Mm -hmm. kids who are just hardier and uh I don't want to call them simpler. No, <laughs> like, no. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Kids I, who are totally just more, more solid and grounded and they're not yeah. as sensitive and they're not as vulnerable. So yeah. sensitive kids are more vulnerable. We all, we're yeah. all more vulnerable. So we have to be more and more discerning and we have to teach them, like you were saying, that inner authority. So they know how to say no, and they know how to walk away from situations that that don't feel good and we don't go it's fine you're good get used to it what I, you know like you're teaching them to override their internal signals so yeah and, and this is what i'm i'm teaching women how to undo all of that conditioning and programming and um it can be a big job to come back to your inner authority and trust it because we haven't exercised it and we haven't trusted it for so long Um, but it's still there and it's still the most powerful thing and it will take you to the the sky to the stars and beyond so it's such worthwhile work let's talk about that let's um shift gears let's talk about the work that you are we're doing are doing with women and your courses and just let's talk about that a bit Yeah. So my work primarily focuses now, and it's been such an evolution from being a nutritionist on co-creating our lives. So we get to, I think we get to do, be, and have everything that we want in life. And by working through, first of all, embodiment, where you get to come back out of the head because the head has been running the ship for way too long. We've got to come back into feeling the body. That's where the wisdom and the guidance lies the brain is way too easily conditioned. So come, so embodiment is huge coming back into the body and feeling, and then a lot of self-awareness work. So like, what are these stories that are running in our heads about our limitations and what we can or can't have, or what we deserve or who we are. Um, and really like helping people to come back to using joy as their navigation system as well, because they think so many women have lost joy. We just get into the the system or the machine where you you parent and you work and you take care of your house and you just do all these things but you're not you're just surviving you're not thriving so it's really about like what do you want to create in your life and you're such a perfect example of this Tara and just uprooting and selling the house and just like following this dream being like let's just see what happens so it's like life gets to become this experiment and this journey rather than just this 
path that may not be right for you. So whether you want to co-create a business or, um, you know, change your health radically or find a more soul aligned relationship, um, or, or just create a different lifestyle for yourself. It's about that. And then as I was doing this work, I found that I had a lot of healers in my practice. And so I started teach, I do intuition courses and I teach people how to get back in touch with their inner authority. And then um, a lot of women go on to work with me and uh, build their spiritual businesses as well. Um, so they kind of do what I do and doing one-to-one -one coaching, retreats and live events, uh, courses online, all kinds of stuff like that. So it's really fun and it's really rewarding and people get these massive quantum shifts in what they're looking for when they dedicate time and energy and they, they come to a space where they can <clears throat> really be in their authenticity because your authenticity is your magnetism. It is your, your ability to manifest is being in the truth of who you are in the present moment. And so like really letting go of shame and really letting go of judgment. And there's some deep shadow work that goes along with it. But um, when you do that, when you clean up your yard, as we said, what you can create is really boundless. And so that's been my journey um, in building a business, completely reversing all these health conditions that I had, creating financial security for myself. I work like three days a week. Um, I get to be home with my daughter as much as I, I want. Um, I, I get to have a horse now, like dreams that I had that I thought I could only have as much as my parents have. I now get to have a lot more. And, and my work is so fulfilling. Like it lights me up. I get so excited about it every day. And I leave, I get to have chats like this and leave feeling like just totally juiced up for the rest of the day. My partner says to me, like, I really like it when you work, like you should work more. And I'm like, yeah, I should, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, creating the life of your dreams. That's really what I think everyone should be working towards. And it, it gets to be fun. Yeah, it gets to be joyful. So that's what I do now. I love this. Um, I have a question about your retreats because they look amazing. I don't know if you're doing, I don't know with everything in the world going on, if you're doing one this year, but still, would you like to talk like a little bit about what you guys do there? Cause yeah, so I do, um, not as many in the last two years, of course, yeah. but, um, Obviously. I'll do three or four day retreats and I, uh, I often host them in Newport, Rhode Island. So we're right near the beach here. It's like a really just beautiful New England Oceanside community. Um, or I'll do like one or two day live healing events. And a lot of times people will fly in just for like a one day event, just to be a part of that experience. And uh, sometimes like my most recent one we just did in um, Charleston, South Carolina. That was amazing. So um they're really just a place to come and be around like-minded people, like be in this safe container where your aura can be totally open and you can get more in touch with the truth of who you are. You know, you can get back to that soul essence, if you will. And I've, I've had women I worked with for like a year and then they'll come to a retreat for four days and they'll leave and, and they'll be saying to me like, Rachel, I'm a different person after this event. And I'm like, you are? I'm like, we've been working together for a year. And they're like, yeah, I'm a completely different person. So when you come to these live events and you're there 24 seven and you eat all the high vibration food and you're around the people and the intuitive messages are coming in and you're connecting in different ways. And I have amazing support staff that are like just such talented earth angels that come um, you really do get these like quantum shifts from coming to live events. So I'm thinking about doing like a two day event in July. I haven't planned another big retreat yet. Um, but they're really powerful and they're just really fun at the last retreat, all the women got in like a van together and they left to go like have an adventure day. They had never met until that. And like, they went on this whole adventure, um, before they all went to the airport together. So it was just, I was like, oh, this is a dream come true. Like my, my little flock is <laughs> going off <laughs> together, um, continuing the journey. So yeah, it's really special. It's really powerful. I go to at least one retreat a year, probably more like two, 
because they are so transformative when you go to a space that's holding the right energy. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Is there yeah. anything else you'd like to add? Because all of this was actually very helpful. And I didn't even think we were going to like talk about discernment and stuff like that, but <laughs> it worked. It worked out. Yeah. I think like if I can leave you with a couple nuggets, it would be to really get in touch with your, your inner authority, your inner wisdom, your intuition, which comes in many different forms and like dedicate some time to like practice trusting it. Like that's a whole like course and thing. I'm, I'm going to do a course on intuition and inner authority. That's actually the next thing I'm going to create. Um, but, but coming back to like trusting yourself, because that's what people, a lot of us have lost is this self-trust. We make these decisions out of obligation and they just, they never serve us. They never bring us to joy. And so coming back to that place of self-trust, um, watching your inner energy, watching how it changes in environments, watch it, how it changes um, when you go to a retreat versus when you're at work, watching how it changes with who you're around, with your family, with your mother-in-law, with whomever, right? Like, and really paying attention to energy exchange is, is so huge. And then, um, and then that discernment piece is part of that inner authority too, like really trusting and just keeping yourself safe, keeping yourself, keeping your energy field clean and clear is, is super, super key. So I have like free meditations and stuff on my website. If you need help with like, how do I even get started with this? Like there's grounding meditations, there's energy field clearing meditations, there's stuff like that, that are really simple. And, um, you can get a lot from just practicing that. So that's what, those are the nuggets I'll leave you with. Oh, thank you. And where can, uh, where can everyone find you? Yeah, the best place is at rachelpellison.com. Um, that's how you can work with me. That's where you can find all my loads of free videos and blogs and stuff. And then the other place I hang out the most is on Instagram, which is rachelpellison.healing. I will say sure your, the scenes there. Yeah, <laughs> your <laughs> website does have, for somebody who loves being a resource hub, your website has so much information. Yeah. Um, so and recipes too. There's still and, recipes. And recipes. <laughs> yeah. But all kinds of information. And then I, like you have YouTube videos and it's mm -hmm. great. It's a great yep. resource. So yeah. check it out, people. Um, thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I know. And um, I hope that we get to do this again soon. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. I'd love to come back. All right.